becomes a hero till the villain comes along. And in some cases, even the strong ones get thrashed to extremes way beyond what Kendrick Lamar did to Drake. Liar, liar, piss on fire. Yeah, usually you'd believe you're safe when a superhero comes to the rescue, but if they don't pick their opponents wisely, they're in for a world of pain. Don't believe me? Well, come on and join the dark side with the top 25 moments when superheroes messed with the wrong guy. Are you ready, kids? Aye, aye, Captain! <laughs> the Tricky Quickie is a fan favourite in the X-Men universe, and the main reasons for that are his sass and, well, I guess his speed, I suppose. Are you on speed? I am speed, motherfucker! However, if you put up a speedster against the God of the Mutants, then I don't know how anyone would be rooting for the guy whose most powerful attack is a fast punch. Sure, this is the same movie where we see Quicksilver rescuing an entire mansion's worth of mutants from a deadly explosion, but he's clearly no match for the mighty apocalypse, and their difference in powers is so clear here that even Daredevil can see it without having to rely on his other senses. Yeah, our favourite speedster manages to get a head start by punching Apocalypse around as if he's playing with a G.I. Joe action figure, but it doesn't take long for the mutant god to realise his opponent's strength. All it takes is for his eyes to change colour, and then Quicksilver is pretty much neutered when it comes to using his powers. What follows is a thorough thrashing that makes you wonder if this humiliation was what pushed Evan Peters to play the role of a cannibalistic serial killer later on in his career. Foolish child. <laughs> Ronan the Accuser! You are the one who transmitted the message. You killed my wife. You killed my daughter! You know, when they introduced Drax in the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie, it looked as if they were looking at a formidable opponent in any given situation. It was pretty much the same vibe you'd get when you'd see Dave Bautista showing up to exert his dominance in WWE. The However, after he finally meets the man he wants to slay as part of his revenge, Drax is reduced to a little wuss. Ronan doesn't even consider him to be a serious contender and pretty much toys around with him to win the fight. Sure, Drax does whatever he can to make some kind of impact, but this was essentially like sending Kevin Hart to fight Dwayne Johnson. My fans don't need to hear that because we're better than your people. <laughs> There's nothing that Drax can do to gain the advantage or even gain Ronan's approval as a fighter. Instead, he just gets humiliated even further when Ronan says that he doesn't remember ending his family and he probably won't remember ending him either. Bro even tops it by tossing Drax aside to drown like a piece of garbage. Yes, it is a savage statement, but it is true. The irony in this scene is Drax the Destroyer accuses Ronan and Ronan the Accuser destroys Drax. <laughs> Doubt I'll remember killing you either. You tried to fix me. Me go. Now I'm gonna fix you. Spider-Man may have felt like the most vulnerable in front of Iron Man when he got snapped to ashes, but the Green Goblin made sure to strike a whole new level of fear into him when they fought each other in round one. The reveal of Norman Osborn being controlled by the Goblin was something timed well, but it also needed to be followed up by something extraordinary. It came in the form of an absolute thrashing of our friendly neighbourhood Spider-Man and the murder of Aunt May. The sheer evil on display here was enough to defeat Peter Parker and the audience at the same time. I mean, why the heck is this psycho laughing while Spidey trying his best to beat his face? Sure, he might be holding back a bit, but even then, these must be really strong strikes. That was such a creepy moment and kudos to William Dafoe for not only giving us such a tremendous performance, but also living up to his name. The real crime here though was taking Aunt May away from us. I could probably handle the Aunt Mays from the previous franchises, but losing Marissa Tomei was personal. Huh? Heck, even I wanted to shove that glider down Osborne's face later in round two. Peter, Peter, Peter. No good deed goes unpunished. You can thank me later. <gasps> You're not brave. Okay, so Batman may not be the villain here, but this video talks about superheroes messing with the wrong guy, and in this case, Kal-El messed with the wrong son of Martha. 
Yeah, we all know that Superman would win easily if he actually took Bruce Wayne seriously, but those are just excuses at the end of the day, because the Dark Knight got himself in a position to end the Man of Steel, which is something that even General Zod couldn't accomplish by himself. The battle was definitely an interesting one to watch, but with all that kryptonite, there was no way Clark Kent was going to get the better of Batman. He did get an opportunity in between when Batman's punches stopped working, but he didn't go for the kill then, so he became the prey instead. Of course, all of this only applies until he used the magic word to stop Bruce from making a very big mistake. The power of Martha comes to the rescue, but when it comes to keeping Superman alive, that only lasted till the final fight of the movie. I bet your parents taught you that you mean something. That you're here for a reason. My parents taught me a different lesson. I won't hurt you anymore. No one will. The angry green giant may be a force to be reckoned with when it comes to people on Earth, but the moment you bring gods into the equation, things take a back seat. In Thor Ragnarok, we see a perfect example when he tries to anger the god of thunder and it only backfires on him in front of a live audience. Don't get me wrong, the Hulk is as strong as they come, but Thor is no muck with his punches either. The strikes he lands on the angry green giant makes everyone silent in the ring, and when he unleashes his inner thunder, it genuinely looked like the Hulk was going to get thrashed really bad. I can't believe I'm going to say this, but the Hulk got saved from the God of Thunder because of a little electric shocker that was attached to his neck. Yeah, I'm aware that Hulk technically wins this fight, but that's only because of convenient plot armor and forced comedy. I swear, Thor was totally bent on proving he's the strongest Avenger, and he was definitely going to get the job done too. Thankfully, we didn't have to see either of these brutes turn into the villain. If I were to reach our rendezvous on Titan, with the time stone still attached to your vaguely irritating person, there would be judgment. Ebony Moore may be looked at as this painstaking suck up to Thanos, that doesn't mean he's useless in battle. He proves his weight in gold when he faces off against Doctor Strange and strangely dominates him as well. I mean, I was actually a little disappointed in Steven here, because this is the same dude who managed to hold his own against Thanos later on in the same movie. Anyway, Moore manages to trap him right where he wants him, and there's no amount of sassy dialogue that can disguise the fact that Doctor Strange was comprehensively outmatched here. Like, he was genuinely made to look like a circus clown in front of his opponent, and it made the audience wonder just how powerful the Mad Titan's pawns really were. Very good, very nice. Even the man's cloak couldn't prevent him from getting kidnapped, which is a pretty big statement. And yes, the torturing that happens later on also shows just how ruthless Ebony Moore can be if he wants to turn his freak on. I mean, I mean, um, uh, get nasty? Oh, oh, damn it, there's really no way I can say anything here without making it sound dirty, right? Your powers are inconsequential compared to mine. Yeah, but the kid's seen more movies. <laughs> We all love Iron Man, and we know just how strong he can be if he wants to get serious. However, Tony Stark needs to remember that he isn't really meant for combat against muscular men on a special diet of super soldier serum. The Winter Soldier's breaking out scene had him show Mr. Stark his place after he was done smacking the ladies. Damn it, man, I did it again, didn't I? Anyway, Bucky is on that Russian hypnosis routine here, so he doesn't spare anyone coming his way, and Iron Man happens to be one of his victims because he doesn't have his main suit. Sure, that watch was pretty useful for the first strike, but after that, it was clearly just Tony trying his best to keep Bucky inside the premises for as long as possible. Yeah, T'Challa shows up right after to give us a glimpse of his Black Panther skills, and he's able to teach the Winter Soldier a lesson even without his suit. But when it comes to Tony, Black Widow, or Sharon Carter, they were undoubtedly unmatched. Man, Magneto is literally Wolverine's kryptonite. After seeing Logan suffer at the hands of Eric in the very first X-Men film, we were all hoping for a much better encounter in this particular scene. However, that wasn't meant to be, and if anything, this kind of felt like an even more embarrassing defeat. 
If you think about how this whole battle plays out, it's brilliant how we were led to believe that Wolverine would stand a chance against Magneto this time, only to completely have those hopes squashed and make him suffer his most humiliating and painful beatdown thus far. It's a case of subversion done well, and I've got to laud the writers for surprising the audience with this one. There really was a no contest with Eric forcing Metalin to his opponent because this time he doesn't have his adamantium skeleton. Also, Wolverine getting impaled like that has got to be one of the most brutal and disturbing things I've ever seen in a Marvel movie. Sure, they didn't show any blood or anything like that, but that must have hurt in the most damning way possible. So much for being a survivor. Steppenwolf may not have felt like a great villain in the theatrical cut of the Justice League, but in the Snyder Cut, he definitely gained more respect in my eyes. What? If we consider how he dominated the Amazons in this film, then he surely deserves to be called their lord too. Man, I'm really tapping into my intrusive thoughts today now, aren't I? Well, as far as the PG-13 version of the fight goes, we see Steppenwolf casually defeating multiple Amazon warriors without having to put much effort in. Yes, they did have to protect the cube, so they had no choice, but these ladies were clearly up against an opponent who was way above their pay grade. Now, this isn't to say that he didn't take hits, but the thing is he brushes them off almost instantly, so everything that was being thrown at him turned out to be in vain by the end of it. That massive Amazonian army charging at Steppenwolf towards the end of this scene may have led to an epic battle, but our man teleports away from the action because he knows this movie can't go beyond its four hour runtime. Yes, we will find the others. Now, I'm not too sure how to frame this scene because it actually showcases Optimus Prime taking on multiple Decepticons at the same time and even ending one of them in the most savage way imaginable. However, he does lose his life by the end of this scene and Megatron makes sure to mock his strength as he lands the finishing move. So yes, Mr. Prime did mess with the wrong guys over here by going solo. These were all grade A Decepticons, with one of them being their freaking leader, so it was obvious that Optimus was going to face an uphill battle. Finally, a worthy opponent. To be honest, he should have forgotten about looking for Sam as well, because Shia LaBeouf's career was going to go downhill after the third Transformers movie anyway. There were some pretty badass moments though, such as when Optimus loudly declared that he would take all of the Decepticons on himself, but at the end of the day, he loses his life and gets humiliated in the process. You'll never stop at one. Leave it to Megatron to make sure that his opponent gets a nice dose of emotional damage on his way to heaven. So weak. The Tesseract. Or your brother's head. I assume you have a preference. The Russo brothers sure knew what they were doing when they introduced the MCU's main villain by having him take down the Asgardian brothers right at the start of Infinity War. Like, imagine worshipping a couple of gods, and then you see the both of them getting violated by a giant purple dude. Once again, that doesn't sound right, does it? But what I'm basically trying to say here is that both Thor and Loki were no match for Thanos, despite being the gods of thunder and mischief. Okay, maybe Loki was nowhere even close to the Mad Titan, but at least Thor should have put up more of a fight. I mean, he did just awaken his inner thunder in the previous film and gave a good fight to his sister, the Goddess of Death. However, Thanos didn't care about legacies or fan following, so he not only defeated the God of Thunder, but also toyed with him in front of Loki to get him to submit. Yes, I've got to give props to the God of Mischief for trying to deceive his opponent. Even if he did succeed in this tactic, I doubt he would have had the strength to cut through Thanos' neck. You will never be... Do not take a man who can literally absorb energy and then bend it to his liking, or in this case, curve it to make a young mutant explode. Darwin getting owned by Shaw was definitely the second most emotional moment of this film, with first place undeniably belonging to Magneto and his mom. 
It was a pretty silly decision to take on shore using an inexperienced Alex, but I guess youth comes with its flaws in judgment. The fact that Shaw didn't even flinch while absorbing the blast or hesitate before forming it into a ball to put into Darwin shows us just how cold he is as a villain. And yeah, I know a lot of people are complaining about Darwin not being able to adapt to the energy ball, but the comics will answer this question for you. There's a chapter where he absorbed energy, but his body was having issues adapting, so he exploded. However, he came back an issue or two later as a being of energy, later being able to create a physical body. That does it! Oh! Oh! oh. Canada! Remember those bullies who'd hold your hands, hit you with your own hands and then ask, Hey bro, why are you hitting yourself? Yeah, I hated those guys, but in this case, the bully and the bullied are both none other than Wade Wilson himself. Colossus is a man who prefers not to get violent as can be seen in his general demeanour. However, Deadpool can't let any buff dude rest easy, so he decides to give him a taste of his deadly punches and kicks. The only problem is, none of those attacks work on a guy whose entire body is made of steel. Even the most reliable strike against a male led to Deadpool worrying for the woman who would marry Colossus. Oh, your poor wife. You really should stop. The only time his opponent lands a blow is when he sends Deadpool flying into a car. Yeah, I don't think any scenes come close to how hilarious this realization is that Deadpool has clearly messed with the wrong guy. Do you have off switch? Yeah, it's right next to the prostate. Or is that the on switch? Enough. You can't win, Darth. If you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. This scene was already pretty popular when it released, but after we got to see how close Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker were in the prequel trilogy, we realized just how legendary this encounter was. Now, please remember that this was shot all the way back in the 70s, so it doesn't have the fast-paced action choreography that's become such a standard nowadays. I also read somewhere that the in-canon reason why this fight was so slow was because of Obi-Wan's style, which is extremely defensive by nature. At the same time, Vader was being excessively cautious and timid in his offense, which is completely understandable because who wouldn't want to be that way while fighting the same guy who amputated three of his limbs and left him roasting alive the last time they fought? The point being, even though Obi-Wan was the better fighter for the longest time, his age clearly didn't do him any favours. Also, Vader doesn't use the Force either, so that little pose Obi-Wan strikes just before he's finished shouldn't be used as an excuse to justify his loss. No! Arthur, we need to restrain him. <laughs> Everyone keeps talking about the Justice League as if it's some group that's filled with equally skilled fighters. That may be true for the middle range, but when it comes to Superman, there's no comparison at all. This scene showcases it perfectly as he dominates everyone in the Justice League without having to put much effort in at all. These aren't side heroes we're dealing with either. We're talking Aquaman, Cyborg, Flash and Wonder Woman for crying out loud. No one's even able to land a scratch on him, apart from Princess Diana, who does manage to land a couple of blows, although they don't really do any serious damage. Plus, I'll never mind seeing Gal Gadot embrace her wild side on screen, so it's kind of like a win-win situation. The ones who don't win, though, are the Justice League members who get owned so bad that the audience started wondering if they were even necessary in this movie. But hey, if anyone wants to mess with the Man of Steel, they should know they've picked the wrong target, regardless of who they might be. You did this. I had to. You won't let me live. You won't let me die. Kneel before your queen. I don't think so. Don't you just hate it when your sibling messes around with your toys? That's pretty much what Thor would have felt right here when Hela decides to crush his most beloved hammer to pieces. Normally, putting two gods against each other would at least make for an interesting battle, but this one was over before Thor could even get close to his deranged sister. Mjolnir was made to look like a useless weapon, and that's saying a lot considering it used to be Odin's weapon. <laughs> Hela's calm demeanor and menacing look complement each other so well that there was no other choice but to include this entry in my top 10. As far as dominance goes though, she's so overpowered that the only worthy opponent in this scene is Thor. I'm not even considering Loki, because that dude would have probably met his real parents instantly if he tried to mess with the goddess of death. Who are you? What have you done with Thor? Ah! 
I'm Hella. Hey, look, a TV show makes it to a list that's only been about movies so far. Well, if it's got Kingpin and the freaking Punisher, I really couldn't let such an opportunity pass me by. Now, I'll admit that Frank Castle is tied up during this fight, so it was still impressive to see him being able to compete with Mr. Fisk for a while, but I don't think letting him loose would have made much of a difference over here. After all, the Punisher could have gone for another attack after Kingpin ordered the guards to set him loose, and that's because he realized that he's up against someone who's clearly stronger than him. Yes, Fisk does bleed, but he also stands completely unhinged, so Frank was definitely the smart one to back off while he still had all his bones intact. Man, I still can't get over the fact that Netflix was able to have such a great show on their platform at the time. Release him! Mr. Fisk, do it now! You know me. No, I don't! This was peak Marvel, at least when it came to creating stories that could be relatable to normal films. I'm sure even Martin Scorsese would agree with me when I say that the Russo brothers used the influence of his own gangster movies to make this a more believable superhero film. Now, when it comes to mismatched fights, this is an interesting one because, technically speaking, Captain America should be able to take on the Winter Soldier. However, Steve Rogers thought he could use the power of friendship to bring his old buddy back. That was clearly a mistake because Bucky used that opportunity to tear into him. Yeah, he does eventually recall who he is, but damn, was it really worth it with all those injuries and almost drowning? Like, what would have happened if Bucky just went, nah, let him drown? You're my mission. Then finish it. Killing is making a choice. Where are they? Choose between one life or the other. Your friend, the district attorney. Or is brushing right to be <laughs> Messing with the wrong person doesn't always mean you have to be beaten down by sheer strength. When it comes to the Joker, poor Batman had to face the worst possible loss he could have experienced in his adult life. Losing Rachel was a perfect example of what could happen to you if you mess with the Joker. It doesn't even matter if you're freaking Bruce Wayne, he'll still find a way to make you suffer. It was after this moment that Batman started to exercise more caution while dealing with the Joker, and to be honest, can we blame him for that? Not only did the Joker manage to end his girlfriend, he also managed to successfully convert her secondary lover into the secondary villain of the movie. Bro was writing the script alongside Christopher Nolan. Harvey, it's okay. It's alright, listen. Some... Don't let it control you. Normally, you'd back someone like Charles Xavier to take on a fellow telepath, but in this case, Bro got the Thanos experience before the MCU was even a thing in our lives. Facing off against a Phoenix Force is no small feat, and Professor X learned that the hard way as he got disintegrated like any other random person. It just goes on to show how ridiculously powerful Jean Grey is when the Phoenix takes over. She can't be stopped, even by the strongest telepath in the X-Men franchise. You know, this kind of violence reminds me of my girlfriend whenever I refuse to get her ice cream. <laughs> Maybe Charles should have used that tactic in front of Jean. Iron Man is the key reason why the MCU was so successful and he's an extremely powerful fighter, but even his best suit wasn't good enough to take down the Mad Titan. The Nanobot suit pulled out each and every one of its tricks on Thanos, but the man just kept coming back with one trick after another. I mean, he literally started off by throwing a freaking moon at Iron Man, so I don't think anyone should expect Tony Stark to win this one. He was evidently outmatched, so we should at least appreciate the fact that he was able to make his opponent bleed. You have my respect, Stark. When I'm done, half of humanity will still be alive. Well, the Man of Steel may be unmatched when it comes to his powers, but if he's up against Kryptonite, then he's no match even for someone like Lex Luthor. The beatdown handed to him in this scene is worse than torture, because it's basically the humiliation of the world's strongest superhero. Seeing Kevin Spacey in a negative role just accentuates it now because of all of the allegations, so the impact of him shamelessly hurting Clark Kent really hits hard. Never in my life would I have imagined someone like Kal-El being in such a position against a human who's not Batman, but here we are. Black 
Bolt could destroy you with one whisper from his mouth. What mouth? This scene needs no introduction as it's one of the most shocking battles in MCU history. For Wanda to be able to defeat the whole Illuminati, which includes the likes of Professor X and Captain Marvel, is really hard to digest, even though we know she has an unfair power boost thanks to the Dark Hold. The way she eliminates the men is pretty brutal, and while I admit there's an element of wokeness in this battle, I can't deny how ridiculous the Scarlet Witch made the entire Illuminati look in front of her. I guess she isn't the type cut out for conspiracy theories, eh? <laughs> Jesus, Costia Stag, victory has defeated you. Normally, it's always Batman who's going around handing criminals their butts, but in this case, he gets violated so badly by Bane, Bro had to restart his training program. I think Bruce Wayne can be forgiven for thinking he could stand a chance against Bane at first, but he quickly realized that he was all out of sorts once his opponents started to use the shadows against him. Imagine if this was Robert Pattinson's Batman instead of Christian Bale's. That dude would have probably surrendered once he knew the darkness was against him. But yeah, the Dark Knight had no chance of winning this fight, and the victory was decided right from the start, even though it began with a deception by Anne Hathaway, which in itself is an understandable defeat. Oh, you think darkness is your ally? You merely adopted the dark. I was born in it. We have a Hulk. <laughs> You must have been wondering why I didn't mention the Hulk when I was covering the humiliation of Thor and Loki earlier. Well, that's because his beatdown was good enough to reach number one on the list by itself. We normally associate the angry green giant with immeasurable strength and unrivaled rage, but he gets defeated so brutally by Thanos here that Bro didn't even have the face to show himself again for the rest of the entire movie. It's a special kind of humiliation that shocked everyone right from the start, and you'll never see someone like the Hulk getting dominated so easily. Well, I still say this was more bearable than whatever the heck She-Hulk was on, but even so, Bro's ego took the worst blow of them all. <laughs> Hope you like this video, please subscribe to the TV region, and here's another video that I know you're going to enjoy. Bye-bye, Jai. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.